One of the sound bites that you often hear is that Buddhism is all about change. In some cases they say that we're taught to accept change and be okay with it. But then there's the series of questions, if something is changeable, is it going to be easeful or stressful? And the answer is it's stressful. So you don't claim it as you as yours. So that sounds kind of like a negative take on change. And it's so, so often the case, the Buddhist teachings are a lot more complex than the sound bites. There is change, and it's up to us to decide which change is good and which change is bad, what changes should be prevented and what changes can't be prevented, which changes should be encouraged. As the Buddha once said, he, he taught analytically. He would take things apart. Like right now, you're trying to change your mind. That's a good thing, you're trying to develop the path. You've got the potentials inside you, but this is where we run into a problem. The mind is so changeable, so quick to change. You think back about how many times you've probably been practicing the Dharma in previous lifetimes, and then you threw it away. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Some people find that thought depressing. Others find it a challenge. What can we do to make sure we don't go down again? So that kind of change. The change down is to be discouraged. The change up is to be encouraged. So as you're focusing here, notice how the mind wanders off. And try to be quick in catching it. The Buddha's instructions on mindfulness talk about two activities. One is to put aside greed and distress with reference to the world, and there is to stay focused, keep track of, say, the body in and of itself, or the breath. So you're doing two things at once. You're trying to create a sense of st steadiness, consistency in your case here, consistency in your keeping track of the breath all the way in, all the way on, then again and again and again. And watch out for any tendency to slip off. It's like those squirrel colonies we have. The squirrels are out eating around, but there'll be one squirrel standing with it, sentry, keeping watch, in case the crows come, in case the hawks come, the coyotes. So part of the mind has to be keeping watch as the other part begins to settle in. This is part of what directed thought and evaluation is all about. There will come a point where the mind settles in so thoroughly that the act of having to keep watch gets milder, falls more and more into the background. But it always has to be there. You've got to protect what you've got. You've got to resist that kind of change. This, as the Buddha said, is one of the duties of mindfulness when it becomes a governing principle. If something is good that hasn't arisen yet in the mind, you try to give rise to it. Once it's there, though, you don't let it go. You hold on to it. So that's the kind of change you encourage and also the change you resist. The change that the Buddha said is really bad is when we latch on to something for the hopes that's going to be good for us, and it's going to let us down. And so you want to see, okay, where does this thing change? Where is it unreliable? Because it's not just change that the Buddha is talking about in that series of perceptions, the three perceptions. He's talking about inconstancy and unreliability. You have this unreliability in your mind, but also unreliability in the things that you tend to latch on to. So if you see that your attachments are unskillful, you're trying to see where can you see the drawbacks so that it's not worth it. At the same time, you provide yourself with something good to hold on to, because otherwise, no matter how much you may let go, you just grab hold again. 
It's like climbing a ladder. If you have only one rung in the ladder, you're not going to let it go. You have to hold on, otherwise, otherwise you're going to fall. But when you have a series of rungs, then you can see, okay, this rung is higher than that rung, and it gets me to where I want to go. Then you hold on to the higher rung, so you can let go of the lower one. So as you contemplate in constancy, stress, not self, you want to make sure that you have something good to hold to. This is why we try to make the mind as constant as possible, with a sense of ease, so you can stay with the constancy, so you can stay with the ease. Take that as your new foundation. Provide yourself with many rungs going up the ladder, and you get to your safe place. Then you can let go of the ladder. In the meantime, don't let go. We hear so much about how the teaching is about not only change but also letting go. But here again, the Buddha was selective and strategic in telling you when to let go of what. The things you're going to have to hold on to in the meantime until you can finally let go. So it teaches you how to develop them. Strengths like conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. They may not be all that weak, but as you exercise them, they do get stronger. We were talking the other day about comparing exercising the mind to exercising a muscle. There are some parallels. There's a lot of repetition. But it's nothing but repetition. The muscle gets worn out, and the same with the mind. This is why we don't just look at it in, out, in, out, in, out for the breath. We're trying to figure out what kind of breathing nourishes the body, which parts of the body need to be nourished right now. When you run up against different pains or blockages in the body, how do you deal with them? Sometimes you focus right at the blockage. And sometimes you have to focus someplace else. The other day I was suffering from a pain in my hip. We had a doctor as an acupuncturist happened to come. So he gave me a treatment. And the main part of the treatment was a needle in, in my hand. The left hand the left hip was the problem. The needle went into my right hand. It relieved a lot of the pain in the hip. So things in the body are connected in strange ways. So sometimes if you see a blockage and you try to push your way through, you just create more problems. So you step back and say, well, what could this be connected to? In the same way when you exercise a muscle, you do have to change the exercises every now and then. So you change the breath, or sometimes you even have to put the breath aside for a time being and work on other topics. So in that way, exercising the mind and exercising the muscle are the same. The difference, of course, is you're exercising the mind to get quiet. When you exercise the body, you have to move it around. But exercising the mind means getting it quiet, getting it more and more quiet and more and more quiet as you peel away the different layers of first the distractions to the concentration. And then as you get into concentration, you begin to see that the activities that you're doing to get the mind to settle down. After a while, they're no longer necessary. You can stay there with less and less and less activity. And that provides you with a, a kind of change that it's good to study. When you move from one level of concentration to another, what do you drop? What goes on? Because you want to be able to peel away the events in the mind. So you can see them simply as events. Then you can ask yourself what I could possibly build out of these events. And in the case of concentration, you can provide yourself with a temporary home, which is much better than you can create in, with other states of becoming. But it does have its drawbacks. It is put together. So use the temporary home as your protection, as your place of rest.
place of nourishment. So you can peel away your interest in things outside that would otherwise cause you to do or say or think unskillful things. And then when the area around you is cleared, then you can look at the drawbacks of this house you've got. And you can see that it's built out of impermanent things, things that can't last. Not just impermanent, also in constant. They waver. You have to be constantly adjusting. They're minor, minor adjustments. They're very subtle, but they're there. And it's the subtle things in the mind that you need to see. So in this case, you're going to be studying change. Try to get sensitive to when the level of stress in the mind goes up, when it goes down, and ask yourself, well, what did I just do? That gives you a clue that something's going on in the mind, and it's in the mind that you want to look. When the Buddha talks about the origination of suffering, he doesn't mean things outside causing you to suffer. Society may be in a mess right now. People can be abusive, threatening, totally crazy. But that's not the source of the suffering. The source of the suffering, the Buddha says, is inside the mind itself. That's what he means by origination. It's a cause, and it's inside your mind. So you keep asking yourself, what did I do? What did I do? So you're studying these subtle changes. So you can let them go. Try to figure out what you did, let that go. That's what clinging is. It's an activity that you do again and again and again. You're kind of addicted to it. You do it regardless whether the results are good or bad. You think you simply you have to do it. But in the meditation, we can begin to call that into question. And we can stop doing the things that are causing suffering. So in this case, the subtle variations in the mind are a clue as to what's going on. They alert us to activities we might have missed otherwise. So you do want to become sensitive to change. And realize there are lots of different kinds of change. Learn to sort them out. Which changes should be avoided, which changes have to be accepted, which changes should be encouraged. When you see that there are these three kinds, then you can take advantage of the Buddha's teachings on inconstancy and his teachings on the unreliability of the mind, but also our potential, put them to good use, as he said. If we couldn't develop skillful qualities and abandon unskillful qualities, i.e., if we couldn't make changes in our mind, there would be no use in teaching. And if we didn't benefit from developing skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful ones, we wouldn't have taught that either. But we can make these good changes. So focus on the good changes you can make. And be on the alert for the changes in the mind that would pull you away, because they pulled you away many, many, many times before. There's that phrase in, the, in John Munn's last Dharma talk. He says he didn't want to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. Where your defilements have pulled you away from the practice. And if you think about them laughing at you, that should give you good encouragement good motivation to say, well, this time around, we're not going to let it happen.